Hello, everyone. Uh, I bet this is a surprise to everyone watching, but I have one final Tribeca interview. Tribeca may be over, people might have flown home, but I have an interview today with Yvette uh, Amir, Amirian, uh, Amir. apologies, uh, who, uh, who edited the in Integrity of Joseph Chambers. It's a, well, it's kind of, uh, I would describe it as a companion piece, as many others will, to Killing of Two Lovers because it features Plain Cough Crawford, can't speak today, <laughs> uh, Robert and Robert Machoian's um, um, second film together back to back in two years. Um, and basically, it's just about um, um, this guy, Joseph uh, Chambers, who goes out to provide for his family, goes on a hunt by himself, uh, and the things that happen as a result. Um, anyone interested can, even though Tribeca in, in New York is over, you can check it out at Tribeca at Home. I think it costs uh, $15 for a single ticket, and then I, I think there are other options too, which I'll, I'll have in the description of this YouTube link or whatever description I, I, I use. Um, but Yvette, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I know it's super last minute, so I appreciate the uh, the uh, er, just making the time. Sure. Uh, especially after a busy Tribeca, I'm sure. Um, so I've got a ton of questions. I apologize um, because I I've only interviewed one editor before. Okay. Um, I think my last editor interview was back at the Oscars, uh, not last year, but the year before when Sound of Metal won mm. as editing. Um, and I think that was Michael E.G. Nielsen. Yeah. Um, learned a bunch of stuff from him. In fact, I'll probably have like a card somewhere on YouTube <laughs> um, for that interview because it's a really insightful interview. I'd love to see it too. I, I love that film. Yeah, I'll make sure you get it. Um, but yeah, so I have so many questions. Um, I'll try not to keep it too long, though. No, no, go for it. So going to, uh, th this is Clint Crawf Crawford and Robert McJoin's, um second film together, and a lot of people have been describing it as almost a companion piece to e each other. Um, so how would you, as an editor, say they complement each other? Um, I, th that's interesting to me. And I, I think we all knew that there would be some comparisons between the two because Robert certainly has a very uh, distinct style, but, you know, one of the things that he and I would talk about while we were, you know, putting this film together is that killing of two lovers was very much grounded in reality. It was a man going through a divorce and trying to figure out how to salvage his relationship with his wife and keep his family together. And what allowed you to sort of get into his head, obviously, was the um, intense and intricate sound design by Peter Albrechtson. Um, and you see a lot of that thematically in our film as well, because we wanted very much to get inside his head. But I think the difference is that with this film, uh, you know, it's a lot more open. You're able to see, you know, much more clearly where he is. We wanted the forest to really feel like a character. We wanted you to really feel that this person doesn't belong here and shouldn't be here, which was very much the message of the film, obviously. Uh, and it, but, it, but it was meant to be a lot more kind of surreal that rather than being very realistic and grounded in reality. So you hear a lot of things with the sound design, for example, that aren't supposed to be there without giving away too much for anybody who hasn't seen the film. But um, the idea that it was supposed to be you getting inside this person's head, whereas with Killing of Two Lovers, it was he was going through this really intense period and what is he feeling? Whereas with this, it's you know him, he just thinks he's kind of having fun out in the woods and not really realizing what, what waits for him. Yeah, I think that's a pretty great way to describe it because I think it's just this, it reminds me at points of the 2016 remake of Blair Witch. Oh, that's um, interesting where the forest is a character, like you say, where it's like almost like a horror movie at points. You're just waiting for the shoe to drop. And then when it does, it's like, oh no, oh no. Yeah. Um, but um, getting to at your actual job. Um, <laughs> so what was your approach to editing this film? I'm super curious. 
Um, sure. So, I mean, a big part of it, obviously, knowing that Robert had cut a lot of his own films, was trying to gauge what he wanted. And that's my 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 approach with any film that I cut is what does the director want? Ultimately, I'm there to execute their vision and hopefully, uh, you know, be able to contribute my my own creative um, style as well. Uh, and so there was a lot of passing things back and forth in terms of films that we both liked that we thought, you know, were falling in line with thematically what this film was about or in terms of pacing and things like that. Um, and then actually getting the footage as with any other film, I watch it, you know, kind of absorb it, ask a lot of questions. What was your intention behind this? Do you want this to be cut this way? Do you want me to hold on this long shot here? you know, to sort of get inside his head of what he's thinking, but he was very, he was really great about giving me the freedom, especially in that initial assembly. You know, we, when we were editing, the first thing that we do is put together an assembly uh, for the director to be able to watch and see what's working, what's not working, what needs to move, what needs to be restructured, what needs to go away altogether maybe. Um, and so he gave me a lot of freedom in that initial pass. And then moving forward, he gave me a lot of freedom when we kind of hit a wall on something maybe that we couldn't quite crack. So um, that was really that was really nice to be able to have that collaboration with him. Yeah, I'm great that I'm grateful you mentioned assembly cut because there are all these articles out there where they're like, there's an Elvis a version of Elvis that's like four hours long, mm -hmm. or yeah. you know, there's a version of Thor Love and Thunder that's like <laughs> three hours or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I just want to take the time. That's what an assembly cut is. It is the first cut. It is not meant for anyone to see it. There's no, I think people confuse that with a director's cut a lot of the time. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think those those descriptions can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. They, they mean something different in TV, for example, than they do in movies. But uh, with with this, yeah, the the initial assembly was really just for the two of us and our eyes only to be able to see what's working, see what's not. I didn't even have any sound design or, you know, no sound pass. I always, uh, you know, what you saw in the final version is all Peter and Will, our sound designer and and um, composer. Uh, but, you know, I always like to put in backgrounds, make you, you know, you, you want to be able to hear what the forest sounds like, hear the stick breaking, hear the door closing, this and that. But I didn't have any of that in the initial assembly because we really wanted to be able to not waste time. We wanted to be able to get right to it and say, okay, these performances are, are working here, are not working here. We need to move this. We need to restructure this. This scene can go away altogether because if you can feel right away that it's not working, why, you know, continue to waste the time twiddling away on something that, that isn't going to work. So. Right. And um, going to that sound design, it's, you mentioned sticks breaking and something I, I noticed a lot. Um, and this might be due to Peter's work or something you did. Um, I don't know the exact terms for it, um, but I think it's like binaural audio where there's this bird flying around your head, essentially. It's super fantastic. I, I haven't heard anything like it in a long time, um, other than you know, when you go on YouTube and you're like, binaural audio in forest or whatever. <laughs> um, because that's even without like the Dolby Atmos stuff on that a, right. lot, of, yeah. a lot of stuff does. Um, but for even for that, people should check it out. Um, I can't I can't take credit for that. Unfortunately, that's know. all that's all Peter. Uh, but but we, we knew that he was going to do something really special with it. And I, I was really fortunate that I was he was able to do one pass and then I was able to take the film back and Robert and I were able to rework a few things that felt like they weren't maybe moving as quickly as they should or that needed to be drawn out a bit more. So um, I was really grateful to have had that collaboration with Peter and then to be able to be at the mix with him and seeing him kind of work that magic along with Dave Barber, our sound editor, um, was was really a wonderful experience. And I think that's a perfect segue into one of my questions, actually. Sure. It's, I, I so, so sometimes uh, in the editing bay, um, sometimes an editor gets to go on set um, mm -hmm. Sometimes people, uh, editors don't, and they maybe find the cut later on in post-production. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask, um, did you ever have to work together during filming with anyone or at any other point? Uh, and um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, uh, unfortunately, because this was being shot in the middle of the pandemic, um, I wasn't able to go on set. They were really trying to limit, uh, you know, the number of people that they had on set. Um, but that, you know, I, I mean, there are certain editors, Walter Murch is very famously quoted for saying he doesn't like uh, be going to set. 
Um, yeah. You know, I, I, it, I, I don't have a preference one way or the other. It's, it's really great to be there, to be able to experience uh, the director's vision being executed, to be able to see what the cinematographer is doing. All those things are really important. In this case, I just happen to not have access to that. So I was really able to approach it with fresh eyes and just say, okay, this is all I have in front of me. And here's what might be missing. Here's what we might need to pick up. Um, so that was, you know, it, it was a, it was a really cool experience and don't feel like I missed anything by not being there because yeah. Robert was so open and, uh, you know, communicative, but, um, you know, hope, hopefully for future projects, I'll be able to, to be back there. <laughs> yeah. I just think it's cool when so something like that does happen because I've heard of it happening on, you know, say movies like Tenant, obviously those are huge 200, sure. $300 million films, but I'm always interested to hear who's on set. Well, the benefit, yeah, I mean, the benefit obviously is if something's not working as an editor, you get to chime in and say, hey, I've been working at the scene and there's something that seems to be missing or this VFX is, you know, is not working the way that I, you know, I think we had imagined. So there's certainly that budget where, uh, you know, that that's an important factor for sure. Yeah. Um, and um, so you know, you talk about being able to have a fr fresh eyes and there's a long swath of this film that's just, you know, um, Clint Crawford, Joseph uh, walking around um, in the woods at one point, like swinging his rifle against uh, <laughs> some reeds or something. Um, so how, how did you go about or how did you... Mm -hmm try to inject the sense that, oh, there's a, just a ton of downtime during all this yeah. uh, section. I mean, that's that's what we wanted. We, we always talked about the film sort of being these three parts. The first part is, you know, it's just a regular man. He has a family. He's going to go out into the woods and he's going to try and hunt on his own. And it feels like a normal movie. You don't really feel like anything's afoot. And then once he gets into the woods, you start to realize he doesn't have the experience he thinks he does. Something is bound to happen. And you know, one of the things that I kept saying is, well, who, if somebody's watching this, what do they think is going to happen? Do they think he's going to injure them himself that, you know, they, they know that there's nobody there. What is the feeling going to be? And thankfully everybody who's watched it has come back and said, I was really, it was felt really tense. I felt like I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. So, um, you know, while those shots were uh, very long and we had these really, really long takes, there was actually more that we ended up carrying back on. And um, I think one of the tricky things with something like this is when you have these really, really long, um, you know, oneers as we call them, yeah. uh, the, the edit, you can feel the edit a lot more, which is not what we want. You know, we say it's the invisible art. We want to be able to have our, our edit to be, you know, in the background. So when you're on something for a long time, you feel the edit. And I think that contributed a lot to building up that that tension and building up uh you know the fact that he's getting bored he's getting antsy this isn't working the way that he had wanted it to um and we toyed around with that section quite a bit we restructured it uh a lot from what it originally originally was that actually brings up a question i've always wanted to ask um sure. it so when you there's this for those who don't know, when you're doing a one shot, you can't like 1917, for example, mm, yeah. um, there's the illusion of, hey, it's mm. a one shot, but it's not actually a one shot. There's like hidden uh, frames where it's like, oh, no, they cut here, here and here. Um, was I guess, was that built in or uh, did you have like blank slates or anything like that? No, we ours were ours were actually those were like the actual takes. There were a couple of them that we tried to do some split screens, and we toyed around with like punching in, and uh, ultimately never felt right. So we ended up reverting back to the original. And there's actually a lot more coverage than it might seem. The majority of you know him walking around in the woods, yes, it's those wide shots, but there is other coverage, and we we played around with it and just didn't feel right. It felt like you wanted to feel the expanse of the forest. You wanted to feel how small he was in this space. Um, so that was something that we leaned into very, very heavily. Yeah, I think the um, movie begins, correct me if I'm wrong, um, with just a slow pan, a uh, slow dolly, I think. Push in, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah push in. That, that's what it is. Um, from this wide shot um, into just, uh, and then it just cuts as soon as you see them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was, that was 
that was a fun one trying to figure out how long we were going to hold on that. And that was something that had been a part of Robert's script and his vision from, from very early on. So. And you know what I was thinking when I was watching that scene is I was thinking, oh, wouldn't it be really cool if just to make people wonder how they did it, how they did the shot is just transition to a handheld from there. That would mm. like at the end of that shot, just have that like little shake, like somebody's putting it on their shoulder. Mm. Yeah. That would have been cool. But um, <laughs> that's just stuff I randomly think about. <laughs> oh, wouldn't it be cool if I did this? <laughs> um, but um, but I have actually a question from somebody who um, I asked around in a Discord that, hey, mm -hmm. I'm interviewing the editor of The Integrity of Joseph Chambers. I almost forgot the name of the movie. <laughs> um, and said, hey, what do you want me to ask? Uh, and it's kind of a similar question to uh, what you already answered. Um, but he, he asked, um, uh, Eric Striffler of uh, pretty much it asked, um, what percentage of edits did you make in the integrity of Joseph Chambers versus, versus other projects? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I don't know that I ever calculated it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, probably not as many as some of my documentary projects. I, I, I come from a background of documentary and I, I worked on a TV series once where we measured and we had, I think, a 2,000 to 1 shooting ratio in terms of what was shot and what was actually ended up in the show for one episode. Um, so uh, I haven't had a chance to do that for this. I certainly don't think it's as, it's as much. Um, uh, we, we had quite a few takes in certain sections, and then there were others where we had fewer takes. Um, and that's the big difference between cutting docs and narrative. You know, in docs, you're very much handcuffed to what you have. And as a result, there's a lot more footage that you're working from. And in narrative, it's a lot more calculated uh, where there's shot lists that are made, you know, and there's a very particular manner in which the director and the cinematographer capture the footage that you ultimately work from. Yeah, for sure. I, and I kind of got that sense watching the movie. I was like, you know, it's been a really long time since I've seen an edit. Mm. I think the only time you really feel the edit is a, I think it would be not a smash cut, but it's a jump cut mm -hmm. um, from when he's just sitting in the tree in that little uh, blind or whatever you call mm -hmm. it. Uh, and then it's like, it's morning. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that, we we played around with that a lot, and especially with the sound. Uh, and and we did in many ways want you to feel those edits. It was really interesting being at Tribeca and watching it, particularly the second time. There were a couple times where I saw people jump, and that was not that I, you know, it was a good feeling to know that they uh, that they were reacting that way to that, that they were scared or that they were experiencing that with the character. Yeah, this film was like a if if somebody was just having an anxiety attack, I'd be like. That would not oh, be a good movie to watch. <laughs> yeah, like it, it, it feels like as an anxiety attack is I guess what I wanted to say is just like, especially in the latter half of the film, I won't spoil anything for those yeah. who haven't watched it, but it just feels like there's, especially in one scene, there's just like, oh goodness, what's happening? Yeah. What, you know, just this weight of everything um, that happens. Um, but you talked a bit about... Um, watching it uh in person and yeah. I just want to ask you know that um I think this is your um correct me if I'm wrong um mm -hmm. this is the first physical fest that one of your projects has screened at am I wrong uh, I had a, I had a couple of like earlier short films that played at festivals but this is I would say the biggest one yeah for sure yeah so I just want to ask how did that feel after it, like years of you know, um, maybe working on projects that premiered virtually. Mm -hmm. um, how did it feel to just kind of be like, okay, I'm sitting in a oh, theater. Like to watch an audience. Yeah, no, I've, I've had, I've had projects screen with audiences before for sure. Um, but yeah, it had been a couple of years, especially because the last big documentary that I had done, which was for Amazon, we didn't get to have a big, you know, proper premiere for that. Um, and so this was really fun to watch uh, with an audience um, and to be able to be there. You know, I went to all the screenings and it was a really cool experience for sure. You know, you, you're always wondering, like, are people going to laugh in the right places? Are people going to jump in the right places? And they did. And that's a really wonderful feeling to get to, you know, to feel like, OK, I've done my job well with my collaborators and we accomplished what we wanted to accomplish. So it's very it's very validating for sure. What was that Amazon doc for people who want to check it out? 
Oh, sure. I did. I, I was a co-editor on a documentary about Mary J. Blige. She was a very famous, uh, okay. uh, well-known hip hop uh, R&B artist. Uh, and um, it was a beautiful story about the trials and tribulations that she's been through. And it was directed by an Academy Award winning uh, director, Vanessa Roth. And it was handled really um, beautifully. And I'm very proud of it. Uh, so if anybody wants to check it out, it's on Amazon. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the reason I asked is I was like, maybe I've seen the movie you're talking about, but no, I, ha I haven't. Yeah. Um, I think it was Mary J. Blige, My Life or something like that. Yeah, Mary J. Blige is my life. Yeah, she has a, she has a very... Um, she has a really cool fan base uh, that 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 and that was a lot of what we focused on in the film is how she's changed their lives through her music and how it was a very transformative album for her. And um, I knew of her music and I had grown up with her music, but I learned so much more about her, obviously, working on the film. Yeah, so um, I've got two super softball questions sure. um, that may maybe you get all the time. Um, so for those who aren't as familiar with editing, um, mm -hmm. how do you go about creating tone through editing? Um, a big part of it is, uh, you know, one of the earliest meetings that you have with your director is a tone meeting to try and figure out, well, what is it that they're going for? And a lot of that entails conversations. A lot of that entails maybe watching their past movies, maybe watching films that they want you to watch to understand the tone and the pace that they're going for. Um, a lot of it is building the pace through temp music and temp sound design, which I had to do a lot of, obviously, because we didn't have anything close yeah. to what the ultimate sound. It was, it's such a unique sound design that really came together um, in the end. Uh, and so, you know, trying to figure out how to infuse that in those early stages um, and not really knowing what it is that they are going to create. And like I said, thankfully, they were able to create a template that I worked off of to be able to you know, at least see what the film felt like. And then in um, but that's a big part of it. Pacing is a big part of it, obviously. Uh, and and just kind of trying to feel, you know, what feels right and what is feeling too long, what is feeling too fast. Um, and uh, we had so much room to play around with that in this film um, to help build it. I think by nature, the fact that it was these really long takes tonally that creates an atmosphere, like you said, that is very anxiety inducing because when that cut finally happens, you really feel it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I guess kind sort of speaking of, mm -hmm. um, I would have to ask, what do you think the hardest job is as an editor that you've had? Oh, that's Either a project or just something that you, a real big boulder you had to push that up a hill like a specific project or like about editing in general that's really hard let's go editing in general um I mean the thing that's most challenging about it is the thing that's most fun about it which is trying to figure out what your story is um and you know with this I had a really strong script to work from it's not at all like documentary filmmaking where you have to kind of craft the pieces you know out of archival and out of you know footage verite footage and interviews and kind of craft this thing that doesn't really exist. But I think that has given me um, a lot of help now taking it into my narrative work where when there are these challenges that seem like insurmountable, like, oh gosh, this is not working the way that we had written it. This is this was not shot the way that I imagined. And how are we gonna fix this? Um, you know, trying to figure out, well, how do I restructure it? How do I drop a line? How do I move this here? How do I, it, it is very much like putting a puzzle together. So whatever the genre is that you're cutting, Ultimately, that's that's I think the most challenging, but also the most fun part of it is trying to figure out how to um, how to bring that together to make it the best po possible story that it can be. Yeah, I, I think for sure. And you know, you actually just brought up a, a, a interesting question when you're talking about archival documentaries. It's a, mm -hmm. actually something most of the documentaries that I review are archival uh, oh, documentaries, so like. Um, my name is uh, Polly Murray. Uh, I just reviewed Halftime, um, oh, cool. which is a mix of- I had a chance to see that at Tribeca. It was, it was very good. Yeah, so I, I guess I want to ask, with your experience with archival documentaries, you know, mm -hmm. it's actually kind of been a real uh, recent thing um, ever since, I believe, Apollo 19 or, or mm -hmm. Apollo 11. I'm sorry. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of For All Mankind for some reason. Uh -huh. Uh, because I just watched that a couple of days ago, the caught up to mm. season three. Um, but 
you know, you talk about the struggles of that. And I, I just love to just pick your brain about how you think, what, what, what you think about archival documentaries and how you look at, at that as, as an editor too. Yeah, I mean, documentaries certainly, I think, in recent years are having this huge resurgence and and uh, and for good reason. There's a lot of incredible stories out there to tell. Um, I mean, look, archival documentaries or documentaries that are heavy in their archival footage would not be possible or doable without the help of amazing story producers and research producers. And I've been really fortunate that when I've worked on them, when they, we have this heavy amount of archival, we have an incredible team uh, working with us to do that. Um, a, a lot. I think the thing that's most challenging about those is you never know what you're going to be able to keep. So, you know, yeah. you have this amazing piece from, I don't know, CBS or whatever, like, you know, some news organization and you put it in and you find out, I, I had an archival documentary that we found out the day before we were going to have a big premiere with an audience that, hey, this piece that you have from NBC, you've made a cut. Apparently we weren't legally allowed to make a cut. So you have to restore it or you have to add a fade or you have to, you know, they have these very specific rules. So that's always very challenging because you build these sequences that are very tightly woven around these integral pieces to your story. And then you can find out at the, you know, uh, you know, at a moment's notice, Hey, this piece actually isn't allowed to be used, or we have to replace it with this other thing. And then that ultimately changes the tone or the pace and you have to rebuild it. So um, that's just a matter of as an editor, especially in documentaries, but an, an editor in general, you have to remain very flexible and very patient because those things are inevitable. They're going to happen. Yeah, I, I actually made a note while re reviewing halftime. I was like, how did they get all this archival footage and not just like immediately like find, find issues? Or, like just there's that's just... Go ahead. Yeah, that's where, I mean, that's where you have, you know, attorneys involved, uh, research producers, archival producers, those are very specific positions that are integral to be able, being able to, to tell those stories. I would imagine with a movie like that too, she owned a lot of that, you know, I, I, I mean, who knows how that, how that worked. Um, but, you know, we, we owned a lot, we, she owned a lot of our footage too, and it was still stuff that we had to get, that get cleared. Um, so it is very challenging, but like I said, those those positions are really integral to making those types of films happen. And um, then before I let you go, um, I just want to ask because I just realized I had a uh, a question I haven't asked yet. Sure. Um, and it's a cliche one, but what drew you to um, the integrity of Joseph Chambers? Uh, the script and and Robert's previous work, uh, I was familiar with his work and just, you know, doing kind of a deep dive into his his recent films. And, you know, I had an opportunity to watch The Killing of Two Lovers before it was released when they were approaching me about potentially cutting the project and just fell in love with his style. And I think ultimately, though, the script is what drew me to it. There's a particular cut in the movie, which I know exactly, you know, you know which one I'm talking about where I actually there's a shift. Seen it. Oh, you haven't seen it. No, I, I was supposed to see it at, during oh, the- Oh, you haven't seen The Killing of Two Wars. Lovers? Yeah, I will. It's on Hulu. Okay. Oh, okay. No, I'm talking about a cut in The Integrity of Joseph Chambers. Oh, where yeah, they, I've seen it. Yeah, so there's a particular cut that's written into the script, and that was the point where I hit the script, and I said, oh my gosh, like this would be so much fun to put together and play with time and space and, you know, where this person is at, you know, in their head. Um, so yeah, I think that's ultimately what, what drew me to it. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I didn't see Killing of Two Lovers. I still oh, have should. it. It's on Hulu. You should check it out. It's, it's excellent. I, I I love it so much. Yeah, because I was like, because I was actually supposed to vote on it uh, during the Spirit Awards whenever I was nominated. Oh, cool. And and it was one of those things like um, uh, pleasure. Um, I, I was just like, I have too many things to watch uh, because. Yeah. I mean, ever since they added TV to it, it's like, okay, I'll watch all the TV. And then by the time I actually get to the movies, it's like, oh, I have uh, like a day to watch 20 movies. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's a, it's, it's a good one. And if you liked, if you liked this film, I, I'm certain that you'll see a lot of um, thematic elements and uh, creative elements that are mimic or that, that really echo his very specific style, so. Yeah, for sure. I, I've, I've had it recommended to me by, I, I don't even know how many people at this point. It's probably <laughs> been dozens. Year. 
Well, he's uh, he's a very talented filmmaker, so um, I'm excited for you to check it out and see and hear what you think. Let me know what you think. <laughs> yeah, I will. Um, but Yvette, thank you so much for your time. I hope everyone checks out The Integrity of Ghost Chambers. I was glad um, to check it out. Um, uh, even in just, it, it was weird because I actually was, I, I switched over from Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, the Nicolas Cage <laughs> movie, and then switched to that. I was like, oh, I probably watched this before my interview. Uh, and then it's just two totally different films. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Yvette, thank you so much for coming on. And I'll have a link for everyone to check it out, as well as I think there's a trailer um, and a whole bunch of other th things that you need to check out, including um, the Mary J. Blige documentary and Killing of Two Lovers. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Of course.